My name is Laura Simonson, and I have a 12-year-old with autism, so I guess that sort of makes me an expert. Um, but I also get the fortunate um, benefit of working with an organization that is trying to help kids like my son. So um, I feel very blessed in that respect. So that's part of why, um, how I got to this place. Um, in 2009, uh, my son was five, and um, he needed a lot of care at that point, a lot of treatment interventions, and we were paying for it out of pocket because our insurance would not. And so I went to the legislature and uh, led the grassroots effort to pass the legislation to require insurance companies to cover medically necessary treatments, and that did work. So that, that law is named after my son. So, um, and I wasn't working at that time. So about a year later, both of my kids were going to school, and I was like, I need a job. And so um, Easter Sales Goodwill was amazing helping me get that bill passed, and I developed amazing relationships with those folks. And so I just went to them and said, I, I would like to work with you. Could you create me a job? And they said, absolutely. So here I am. <laughs> so um, I am a community liaison, but I also work very heavily with our public policy officer for obvious reasons. Once you start working with legislation, you sort of become addicted to it and realize that there's a lot of changes that need to be made in the world of human services and disabilities, and um, you get pretty fired up about it and want to help. So I'm really happy to be able to do that as part of my work now, in addition to it being personally important to me. So that is me in a nutshell. So um, I guess I know some of you know quite a bit about autism, just seeing who's in the, um, the audience, but how many of you know someone with autism? So good chunk of the room. Interesting that when I first posed that question eight years ago, I would get a rant couple hands. I asked that question a lot when I would testify at the legislature when we were trying to pass Brandon's bill. And a couple legislators may have raised their hand. I think that looks very different now, which kind of speaks to why we're here today. Um, so I'm going to go over the very basics, kind of an Autism 101, um, and I'm going to speak more from a personal standpoint of having a child with autism and talk about more of the early years and the numbers. And then Max is going to take over and start talking about teens and adults and what we're doing now. Um, so we're going to have time at the end for questions too. So I'm happy to speak on any personal experience I have with you guys. So um, autism is a spectrum disorder. So there are individuals from very low functioning who have no communication skills, no verbal skills, a um, lot of sensory challenges to kids who are individuals that have Asperger's, which I know that's kind of went away, but a lot of people know what that means, that are very high functioning, um, can often go unnoticed of having any challenges, but they come across as quirky and everything in between. So it's, it's a huge spectrum, which makes it challenging when you tell someone your child has autism, they picture the person in their head that they know with autism, and it's going to look very different in every single individual. So um, that's been a challenge for me as a mom. When I tell somebody that my son has autism, they might picture Rain Man because they saw that movie. Or they might picture another movie or a book they read, but all of them are very unique. Um, so, and some have intellectual challenges in addition to their autism and sensory challenges, but some of these um, individuals are brilliant and it's more of a social challenge for them. So, all right, so typically somebody with an autism diagnosis has deficits in three of these areas, so all three. They struggle with communication. Um, they may be able to talk of a storm, but the ebb and flow and the personal conversation is very difficult for them. They might go on and on and on about their area of interest, but they don't care if you're even listening or if you even respond. So, and some of them can't speak at all. Some of them use an iPad to speak. Um, so really challenging in the communication. Same thing with social interactions. They like to keep to themselves. They struggle with social interactions. They don't understand, or they have to be, they have to learn to understand that they have thoughts and feelings, but so do you, and so do you. 
they know that they feel that way, but they don't understand that maybe you feel differently. And so that's something that they have to learn. And it is, it's harder for some than others. They also have pretty rigid and repetitive behaviors. They love sameness. I mean, they love it. They feel comfort by sameness. Um, and this is a degree where some kids, they can get beyond it pretty easily. Some kids, if you drive down a different road coming home from therapy because it's closed, they will flip out because that is a change in their routine. Um, so we, we had to work on that. Um, so going back to when my son was really young, Thomas the Train. I don't know what it is about Thomas the Train, um, but most kids on the spectrum, when they're little, are obsessed with Thomas. There should be a warning label on Thomas toys because if you have the whole set, you might want to go to the pediatrician. Um, I mean, it's it's so standard, but they love Thomas the Train. It's I don't I don't get it. The only thing I could come up with when my son was really obsessed with Thomas was that the old videos, you know, that um, from I think they were like from the 80s. Their face didn't move when they talked, and I think they liked that that it was just a stoic face. And there's always a, um, there's a routine in how it operates. They would start it, something bad would happen. They would have to fix it, and then it would be better. So it was always the same. A lot of kids like Blue's Clues for the very same reason. Those shows are the same every time. The, what happens changes, but the structure remains the same. So um, my son also was obsessed with doors and fans. Um, when he was like two, um, it was a great um, babysitter when we'd go to someone, somebody else's house because he was very anxious about being there. We didn't know this because he was two. But he would find a door and he would open it and he would go to the other side and then he would close it and he would do that for hours because it gave him calmness because being in a new place caused him so much anxiety and he didn't have the communication skills to share with us what was going on. Um, fans, just if we, we couldn't take him anywhere that had a paddle fan because he would get so fixated on it that we could not leave that fan or there would be a major meltdown. Um, so lots of unique challenges parents face that have um, individuals on the spectrum in their home. Um, he's totally cool now. I mean, I wish you could see my son. He's like, he doesn't have, yes, he still has challenges, but we can talk about it, and he knows what they are, and he knows how to fix them himself. So it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, he's now more fixated on socially appropriate things, like, uh, let's see, I wrote down stuff. He loves camping. He loves boats. Um, he loves skiing. Um, and he loves maps. So he will research those things. Um, I'm pretty sure he's going to be able to design a better trailer hitch. That might be his calling. <laughs> so, um, you know, it, he knows that he fixates, and then he's like, okay, okay, I got it, I realize, you know. But um, he still loves that sameness. He just knows that not everybody feels quite as passionate about his things. <laughs> All right, move forward here. So here's some signs um, for like babies and toddlers, uh, good red flags. Um, so no big smiles or joyful expressions. Um, the big one here is when they're like nine months, a year old, the engagement with others. You know, you think about babies, neurotypical babies, and they see something they love, and they love you as their human, right? And they want you to share what they're seeing. So they'll look at you, and look, like I'm pointing this way, are you seeing what I'm seeing? Babies on the spectrum don't do that. They are very focused in their own world. So that's a huge red flag. Um, moving on. Um, so the, where it says no two word meaningful phrases without repeating. So meaningful language would be Actually, you know, me looking at you and saying, want milk. You know what I want. That's meaningful language. Um, a lot of kiddos on the spectrum use echolalia, which means they repeat 
what they've heard, and it may not be in the same context in which you're talking about. So my son at two um, had quite a bit of echolalia going on, and I remember he fell down, and he goes, are you okay? And I was like, that's odd. But he was used to me saying that anytime he got hurt, so that was the association with that language. He was using it to tell me I got hurt, but that's actually what I said. So a lot of repeat on of that. And then a lot of these kiddos, they may not be able to carry on any conversation, but they can recite an entire Blue's Blues episode, Echolalia. So that's meaningful language that they're lacking. Um, okay. So some common myths about autism um, is that they won't use any kind of eye contact. They don't really like it, but my son's great at it now. He had to learn. Um, my son's super affectionate. He may not like all the hugs and kisses kind of thing, but he's a super affectionate kid. And some kids don't like affection because the sensory thing, they don't like to be touched. It's literally painful for them to be touched. And then on the other hand, there are kids who are sensory seeking, and they want you to give them a big bear hug and just squeeze them to death. That was my son. So still to this day, I mean, he's 12, and I'm like, Mom, will you squish me? And so I, he'll go lay on his bed, and I will pile all the pillows in our house on top of him, and I will body slam him. <laughs> and it makes him so happy. I got, and then I'll just lay on him with all my weight. We'll get the dog on him. And I can feel all the tension in his body release from the pressure of that weight. So, and they all have unique sensory profiles. Um, they will not develop speech. Well, clearly they do. Um, and it just depends on their um, severity of their autism. They can become independent adults. They need a lot of help to get there. Um, and that's part of why a lot of you are here. Um, that's why Max is here. So, very exciting about that. Um, and that it's developed around age three. Um, it's pretty rare that kids are getting the regressive form of autism. Most of them are born that way. So, um, let's see. Oh, and then that the, they are all geniuses. I mean, I think they're all pretty darn smart in their own way, but very few actually have the savant skills that you read about or you, know, you think about the movie Rain Man. Um, they can be hyper-focused, but sometimes they can't always direct it where they want. Um, for example, I'm pretty sure my son has a photographic memory, but I, he can't turn it off and on when he wants to. It's just random. So we were decorating the Christmas tree this year, and I, I'm a little obsessed with my Christmas tree. It has thousands of ornaments. And um, he, we're taking them out individually, and he's like, this one? went right here last year. I have thousands of ornaments. So he has a picture in his head of our tree from last year, and he was trying to do it the exact same way. I'm like, no, it's OK. We can do it different. He's like, oh, OK. But he remembered. Totally freaked me out. But, um, <laughs> but he can't seem to remember where he put his shoes. So there's that. Um, some of the interventions and strategies that have helped a lot, not only with my child, but with many kids, um, often they need speech therapy, um, whether it's um, if they have no language, teaching them nonverbal communication and maybe using a communication device to, like my son who had language, was teaching him how to communicate with an individual. Um, occupational therapy was huge. They, ha they all have sensory challenges. A lot of them have fine motor challenges. Um, my son worked two years on learning how to hold a pencil properly. He plays the cello now, so it's pretty cool what they can do with the right therapy. Um, early intervention services, which is zero to three, that's part C. Um, you want, anything you want to know about that, David, that's David's program. Um, they do in-home services for uh, kids zero to three that have any kind of developmental delay. So um, they have an awesome service. We used it way back in the day. And then um, after that, you go into Part B services. So that's like the special education schooling, when they get an IEP at school, um, those types of services. And that goes through age 21. Um, we also have um, ABA therapies, which is a very intensive home-based therapy. 
IDI, which is also home-based, um, but more parent-driven, and social skills groups and transition and job training. That's kind of what's available, especially in this area at this point. Okay, so let's talk numbers. So it's going up really, really fast. Um, 2000 was one in 150, and that held for quite a while. Like in early 2009, those were the numbers we used when we were advocating for Brandon's bill. They changed the numbers at the end of the year, um, but they released new numbers in 14, one in 68, one in 54 boys. Um, so basically, that's every grade in every classroom in school district two is going to have one individual on the spectrum. That's a lot of kids. Um, and one other thing I really wanted to point out is those CDC numbers that are 1 in 68, those are kids born in 2002. My son is 12. He was born in 2003. He is not even counted in the statistics yet. He will be an adult in six years. And we're not even counting him. So what are our adult services going to look like in six years if we're not even counting those individuals yet? This is something that keeps me up at night. <laughs> um, let's see. Some other statistics. Um, adults with autism are underemployed or unemployed, other than 15% of them. And I mean even the super smart, highly functional individuals. They don't interview well. They struggle socially. That's what we need to help them. Um, especially those high-functioning adults. They have so much to offer. They're so smart. Um, they often make less money than individuals with other disabilities. Um, and I thought this was interesting. Only 17% of adults with um, autism spectrum disorder have ever lived on their own that are age 20 to 25. So when you're thinking about adult services and the whole family unit, um, I'm hopeful for my son. He's doing great. Hopeful he'll be independent. But if he's not, does that mean when he ages out of school that I'm quitting my job so I can be home with him? And all these parents are having to think of that. Um, like I said, I am hopeful, but I, I also have a kid who got the services he needed when he needed them. And a lot of kids don't have that. So um, the 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 economic challenges go far beyond just the actual services for the child. It's a whole family, and then it's a whole society. Um, so 500,000 teenagers will age into adulthood in the next decade with autism. Half a million. Um, autism costs our society $60 billion annually, with 60% of that going to adult services. So. Those were like the one in 150, or even a one in a thousand are adults. It costs 60% of 60 million, billion, or B with a B. 10 years from now, they predict that cost to be 200 to 400 billion dollars to care for them. So we've got problems that we need to address. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Max to tell you how we were, we're on a very small part trying to address it here in Billings. Are you all super impressed that we coordinated our clothing? We went with that and purple uh, slideshow, so you're welcome. Um, okay, um, so I want to reiterate a few numbers um, as it pertains to the kids I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to talk about young adults and teenagers with autism. Um, so, she already went over this. So, kids born in 1994, one in 150 were diagnosed with autism. And that survey was done in 2002. Um, when kids were born in 2002, one in 68 had an autism diagnosis. Now, there's a discrepancy there, and so it, it kind of begs the question, you can think two ways. You can think there's more autism, there's a rising rate of autism, or there's a ri rising rate of diagnoses, right? And that question is way beyond the scope of what we're going to talk about because you could have a three-week summit on that. Um, but um, what I do want to say is environmental factors can't be ruled out, so we can't say autism isn't increasing. 
Um, but we can say that there's very limited weak data to suggest that. Um, but what we do know is autism diagnostic research has increased greatly in the last 20 years, especially with early intervention. So under three, being able to diagnose even as young as, what, like six months old? Something like that. And, um, and so that, that begs the question, um, did some kids miss the boat in that ramp up of diagnostic research? Um, and that's particularly relevant to kids that are between 14 and 22. So those are the kids that we're talking about. Kids that are born in 1984, born in, 19, or born in 2002. So that's our, our young adults and our teenagers. Did, did some of them fall through the cracks when we went from 1 in 150 in diagnoses to 1 in 68? So, so that's, that's kind of our question. So, um, so that means that a lot of these kids got diagnosed after eight years old or went undiagnosed completely. Um, and just to um, revisit some of the areas that autism will affect. And, and a lot of these kids, so a lot of these kids will be high functioning so that it won't necessarily affect their cognitive abilities enough so that they have an IEP, so that they're, they're going through the special education system. So a lot of these kids will slip through the cracks because of that fact, because there's no cognitive delays, but there's, they still have um, very severe social barriers. Um, so just a few of the areas. So, so keep in mind these kids, despite maybe not having cognitive delays, will have issues with communication, social interaction, or behavior, or how they're just exchanging with any of their peers, or their parents, or their teachers. Um, and executive function, functioning, so, so the way they learn, the way they problem solve, the way they manage their time, the way they are able to be flexible in situations, can be it socially or logistically when schedules change. A lot of kids that I work with, um, that doesn't happen. Stuff starts at 3, not 301. Um, and, and that's a direct result of impaired executive function. Um, or it can be a combina combination of those things. Now. Um, Consider those barriers in a high school setting. So you have the rigors of school. So with your impaired um, executive functioning, ramping up intensity of your studies, that's going to get a lot, a whole lot worse. Um, puberty is a very that's that's a very real thing because these kids have testosterone and estrogen leaking out of their ears, and that's got, not going to make social interaction a lot easier. Um, and there's navigating the sociology of a high school environment. There's cliques, you're interacting with a bunch of types of students. You're interacting with rich kids. You're interacting with poor kids, good looking people, not good looking people. How do you navigate through those things? Those are not descript rules that they're taught. So that's why it's kind of confusing. Um, and it's also a transition period, and that makes it inherently stressful for not just kids with autism, but kids in general. And if you have autism on top of that burden, that step is going to look a whole lot bigger. Um, okay, so I want to talk about means of self-regulation. Self so there's a lot of ways that kids with autism will try to soothe some of their anxieties or agitations. Um, and I, don't, I want to list all of them, but some of these, like oral, that's, I mean, you know, I'll have kids that will want to chew on their sweatshirt string whenever they're feeling like they're having to really concentrate or they're feeling agitated. Um, vestibular input, so being able to move around, that's actually super common that I see um, lots of self-touching, there's lots of arm touching, there's lots of rocking back and forth. Uh, proprioceptive input, like, uh, like what Laura's talking, pressure, bear hugs, being sat on, stuff like that. Um, tactile input, touching, auditory, olfactory, those are all different ways, but the most common one I see with teens is technology, or visual input. Um, it's the number one common denominator of all the kids that we see, technology use and excessive technology use. Um, and I don't want this to turn into a technology smear campaign, but it's a very prevalent factor in all the kids we deal with. And not just kids with autism, but kids in general. Um, so just a few facts on that, and this is not just kids with autism, but kids in general, um, that kids under 18 years old spend eight to nine hours a day connected to a screen. Television, computer, iPad, iPhone, eight to nine hours. Now, if you take into account multitasking, so being watching TV while you're doing your homework, keeping your iPad on while you're reading, that's 11 hours. So that's about every waking moment, because um, they're also at school for seven hours a day. So screen time of the brain. 
again, not trying to smear technology, great tool, but these are very serious factors that we have to deal with when we're looking at students. Um, so there's gray matter atrophy. So gray matter in the brain, that's where a lot of synaptic activity occurs. Compromised white matter integrity, that's what bridges the gap between gray matter in the brain. Um, reduced cortical thickness. So cerebral cortex has layers. Those layers start to shrink when you're being exposed to screen time in excess. Um, impaired cognitive functioning, obviously, if there's reduced cortical thickness. Um, and cravings and impaired dopamine function similar to drug cravings. So, dopamine function. Think about how you feel when you miss your cup of coffee. <laughs> impaired dopamine function. That's what that feels like. A lot of the students we deal with have that impaired dopamine function where there's high levels of agitation or anxiety because of an impaired dopamine function. Now, if there is an addiction to a stimulant that is impairing, further impairing your dopamine function, then what's that going to say about your anxiety or your agitation? So these are things, now, it's far beyond my scope to diagnose an addiction to technology, but that's, that's what it is. And so this is all to say, um, with a lot of these students, especially that are teenage and college age, um, this is a very serious thing, so we're going to be fighting an uphill battle. And in case you're not sure of the severity of these symptoms, these are all consistent with alcoholism. Okay, so screen time and the high-functioning autistic brain. Okay, just real quick. So it is, like I said, it's a dopamine dump. So it can be used as a means of self-medication. So if you do have anxiety, you do have agitation, being plugged into something can soothe some of those feelings. And I think we can all relate to that because there'll be times where I will wake up and I had been scrolling through my timeline on Facebook in five minutes and I didn't know I opened my phone. You know, like it's, your brain will find dopamine the way it needs to. Um, it's also an engagement totally absent of social interaction. And you couldn't say that 20 years. There's not many activities that you can engage in that are completely without social interaction. This is one of those things and that's a very new thing for our society. And when there's a lot of social barriers for some of these kids, why would you go out and engage with the community when you have another means of leisure activity that is completely without having to talk to somebody? Um, and it's also a digital interface. Now, um, rigidity and lack of flexibility like we talked about is, is a pretty big common denominator. Um, digital interfaces, very descript rules. There's no ambiguity. This is a function. And with a brain that's satisfied by square peg, square hole ideology, digital interface is awesome. It satisfies that. There's no ambiguity. Um, and it's also a medium for obsession or fixation. A lot of kids with autism will find one thing to obsess or fixate on. Um, I met one kid a few weeks ago who could tell me everything there is to know about dinosaurs. Everything. How many bones <coughs> dinosaurs had. How tall they grew to be. When they died. Um, now we're starting to see with technology, that's becoming the medium. So knowing everything there is to know about Call of Duty, knowing everything there is to know about Blue's Clues, things like that. Um, so with kids that are of transition age, and because usually how I meet these kids is I'll get called by their parents. Um, and I'll, I'll just say, tell me about your son. Tell me about your daughter. The most common things that we get are no friends. That's usually the first thing. I have no friends, and that's what al alarms the parents. Um, They're completely dependent on their parents for transportation, housing, food, all these things, even though they're supposed to be of an independent age. These are kids that could be as high as, you know, 24, 25 that we see. Um, they're a lot of times carry themselves with irritation or disengagement altogether. Um, and their leisure time is primarily dominated by screen. So, so TV or video games or iPad. I, those, I would say that's the picture at least 80% of the time for kids that work for you. Um, so a little bit about so the kids that we serve. So um, with that demographic in mind, we have a program. So it's a program that started in Salt Lake City um, because it's a hub for autism research. A lot of parents were reaching out to um, universities and nonprofits that are involved in autism intervention, concerned because their 21-year-old, aged out of services at 18, and has been on an adult services waiting list for three years. And all the while, he's been in the basement watching TV and losing all of his 
training that he got through his childhood intervention. Um, and so it was almost like that all that work was wasted. Um, these kids grew more and more dependent on their parents for transportation, for food, for lodging. Everything had to go through their parents. And they were on, a, they were on the couch most of the time. Um, so parents established this mission that they want work-based learning experiences where they can actually be in a workplace setting. Um, they want counseling in terms of how to transition into adult life. Um, being able to understand uh, some of the institutions of the workplace and understanding where those boundaries are and how to conduct yourself in a workplace setting. And self-advocacy training, um, being able to stand up for themselves. Um, not like fighting, but like standing up for their hands. <laughs> um, so, uh, so with the kids we work with, we serve with soft skills training. So everything about navigating through the social environment, that's what we coach on. Um, and it's considered by the state as a pre-employment transition service um, because of its pertinence to assimilating into adult life and into the workforce. Um, and so our idea is that we partner with local businesses and nonprofits, um, set up volunteer job sites. And these job sites are inherently customer service based so that the success of their work is entirely predicated on how well they can navigate socially. Um, and and it, that's actually a critical factor to these job sites because these, these kids can stop shelves. Like, they don't, they don't need work at that. That's, in fact, a lot of these kids that do get stuck doing that feel so patronized that they'll have meltdowns. Um, and it serves, so this can serve as a medium to overcome some of these social barriers. Um, so what we do is we take these kids through assessments and there's kind of three facets to the assessment. And this assessment's intended to understand where these barriers are and which barriers are precluding them from gainful employment. Um, there's a written part, there's an actual verbal interview, and then there's an observation. Um, and I'll just talk. So the, the written assessment, um, this is an important thing because this whole assessment is not really about what they tell me, it's about how they tell me. Um, I'm interested in their information, totally. I also want to see how they give me this information. The written assessment is very important because not only is that important information, but I get to see how they work. How's their time management? How's their spelling? Can they stay in the lines? They're going to have to fill out a job application. That's an important factor. Um, so we'll, their transition questionnaire will tell us about you know, where they're in school, where they see themselves going after school, um, what their interests are, what their job experience is like, um, interest interviews, just stuff that they like so they can write, write down things that they like, and you can kind of see what makes them light up a little bit. Um, there's a pre and post assessment where they can rank uh, different things that make them anxious or feel that are pretty serious barriers to overcome in adult life. Um, and there's a sensory preference checklist. So all the um, means of self-regulation, I get to see what they like to do when they're feeling agitated, or when they feel stressed, or when they feel anxious. That's important for me because if I know that he says, oh, well, I, I always touch the back of my arm when I'm concentrating or when I feel anxious. Very important for me. Because I can see on a site, he's touching the back of his arm. He's anxious. Um, okay, verbal assessment. This is probably the most important part of the assessment because this is a job interview. Um, I don't phrase it to them that way, but to me, I'm looking at it as an employer. Um, I'm asking them a lot about interests. Most of the verbal interview is about interests, um, and I get to see how they deliver information on that side of the desk. Because to achieve gainful employment, you're going to have to sit on that side of the desk and you have to understand how to communicate with someone who's asking about your interests, asking about your history, asking about things that you like to do. Um, so it's within those things that they're talking about that I can start to assess, okay, these are social barriers that they may have in terms of getting employment. Um, because these are things that an employer will see. Um, if he's not making eye contact with me, or he's constantly shaking his leg, or he appears disinterested, I'll think, I'm not hiring this guy. And they might not know that he has a disability. Um, so, a big thing about our assessment that we started using recently is the turtle volcano scale. And this is probably the most important part of the verbal assessment. So, like, so when a turtle gets scared, it goes into its shell. You know, when a volcano experiences pressure, it explodes. Pretty simple. Um, so this is, it's a pretty crude picture. Um, so you see, happy turtle, not happy turtle. And we get to assess each step 
that makes a student completely shut down. So say a student is a turtle. So I'll ask him, so if you feel overwhelmed, tell me what happens. Do you want to yell and do you want to hit? Or do you want to kind of shut down and not talk to him and be by yourself? Um, a lot of times turtle is, is the most common answer. Um, so this is actually, uh, I did, once we first started using this and started practicing on everybody, and this is what I did on my boss, having an anxiety or agitation scale on your boss, super helpful. <laughs> I can know when they're mad. That's really great information. Um, so the reason why we use this, I want to know, I don't want to know what they're feeling. I want to know what it looks like. I want to know what it looks like when they're at each stage getting into their shell because I want to know how to reverse it. So these are all symptoms. So if you look at my boss, she'll tighten her jaw, she'll cleanse her jaw, she'll talk less, and her arms will fold tightly. I don't want to get there. I don't want to see that. What I want to see, I want to be looking for number two. I want to know when they're more defensive and they're more sensitive and they are more argumentative because then I can know we got to turn around. We need to figure out how to turn this around. So we come up with strategies that each step along the way we can reverse because number one, it's more efficient. Because here, it takes two minutes. Here, take a half hour. Up there, they're done for the day. I want to catch them right here. Um, because number one, we're we'll miss out on work. And number two, I'm going to spare them that stress. Um, yeah, so I, I practice on everybody with this scale. Like I practice on buddies and coworkers and practice on my girlfriend. And we're going through <laughs> the assessment. And I pull up the two sheets. And she's, yeah, I'm, I'm a volcano. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and I'm like filling out four, like number three is like, yeah, okay, this is red. Thanks, I'm an idiot. Okay. Um, observation. So, third part of the assessment. Um, so, we actually put them on site and we see how they interact in a job setting. Um, and this is with minimal prompting by me. Um, I want to see how, with the skills that they have right now, how can they navigate through a job site? How can they navigate in the workplace? This is a really telling way to see what makes them anxious and what kind of barriers they have. Um, and then we come up with a report. How are we doing time? great. Um, so then I come up with a report. So then we can kind of condense all that information. That's about an eight-hour process. We can condense down that information into, okay, here's what we're seeing. Here's where we think the barriers are to employment. And then the most important part of the whole assessment process is we sit down with the child or young adult and sit down with the parent. Most times parents are involved, even if they are not a minor. And then we can talk together about goals. Because it does not work for me to dictate goals. If there's not a relationship and there's not a mutual idea of where we want to go, there's going to be much less involvement. They're not going to feel like they have skin in the game. If a student tells me, if we can say, okay, here's what I saw. What do you think a good goal is in terms of getting a job? Because that might be a problem. What do you think would be a good goal? Where, where do you see yourself? And they think, well... You know, I kind of like to be better about talking to people that are just friends, talking to a coworker. That's actually probably our number one goal. And that's awesome because now they put themselves out there. They said, I have this barrier and I'd like to overcome it. They now have seen the game. They've now invested themselves emotionally. Um, and then at that process, uh, at that point in the process, we can pick a peer for the student, um, which this program, the reason why we call it Peer Connections, is each student is paired with a neurotypical like age peer. Most important part, because they have a built-in coworker where they can learn firsthand how to navigate through a professional work relationship. Because a lot of these kids that will lose a job in three weeks or will flunk out of school in his first semester, it's because they don't know how to talk to anybody. They don't know how to ask somebody for help on a question. And this is where they get to learn to do that. Um, so these peers. I'll try to pick to make sure that they match up in school. That's a big idea because I want them to have somebody to say hi to them in the hallways. Um, and I also want them to be similar age for obvious reasons because they're going through the same school stuff they can talk about. What common interests for that age. Um, and then I pick a site for the student. Now sites are designed based on severity of their disability. Um, and then we, we tend to differentiate that between tier one and tier two students. Tier one very high functioning, where they can navigate socially, but with support. Tier two is they don't know how to navigate socially in a specific area without, or even with support, they can't navigate through it. So, um, so like for example, um, our tier two site right now is Wise Wonders, so the Children's Museum downtown. And that's been an awesome site for tier two because the customers that they're interacting with are between four years old and seven years old. 
that's much less intimidating than interacting with an adult. So that's kind of a way to bridge the gap to being able to interact with adult clients, adult customers. And also, a lot of the exhibits are science and engineering related, which a lot of kids really enjoy. Setting up a Lego station, a Lego exhibit, where we're trying to design a tower that can be this tall with these parts, whatever, is a really good way. If we can stimulate their interests, they're going to work much harder towards their goals. Um, so, and and just it's so. What we do is we meet weekly for about three to four hours, and it's going to be a nine-week stretch of time. Um, we'll take 20 to 30 minutes before, and then we kind of get on the same page for what their goals are. Um, that way we can kind of assess how things went last week and what we want to work on this week so they kind of remember because it's been a whole week. Then we'll have a three-hour shift um, with their peer um, and we'll try to do this without a break because a three to four-hour shift for part-time work is usually without a break. Um, and work tolerance is a big thing that we're trying to address. And the 20, the 20 or 30 minutes at the end of the session is feedback. How'd the site go? What do you think would go better next week? Um, and that's a, that's a really important piece because this is we're trying to instill self-reflection. A lot of these kids don't have the impulse to be self-reflective. They can understand how their environment is behaving, but being able to make an association with their own behavior and the environment's reaction is something that's a little abstract to try to explain to somebody. They think, my environment's behaving this way and I don't like that. But then step two of how am I acting to make my environment behave this way that's an abstract concept, and it's a really hard thing to, to really communicate, and that's a big goal of the nine weeks. We want to instill that impulse. Um, and so, a few common goals. Um, body language is a big one. Eye contact, um, being able to maintain an appropriate distance. These are all things that you're going to have to do, especially when you're meeting an employer and you're trying to uh, apply. If there's anything that's wrong with there, a lot of people get turned off, and we try to communicate that first and foremost, body language is going to be huge for getting a job. Um, verbal communication, tonality, um, and clarity, that's, that's a big thing because a lot of our kids will speak either too loud or too soft. Too loud because they want to be heard and they might be predisposed to agitation, and too soft because they're, they're on the turtle scale. That anxiety might make them want to shut down. Um, and workplace boundaries. Workplace boundaries is a big deal. No one teaches you workplace boundaries when in high school. I'll say his name's John, it's James, his name's not John. Um, he's a high school junior, he has a documented autism diagnosis, he is um, very high functioning, he has no cognitive delays, so he's, he does not have an IEP. Um, any knowledge uh, from his counselors or teachers about his autism is, I mean, it's pretty anecdotal, it's the stuff that they heard, it's not like a, a documentation is passed on to them, because, because he, can, he can be in these classes. So there really isn't, it is a need to know basis if he doesn't have an IEP. And, um, he is, there's such minimal social communication. Um, it took probably an hour into our first assessment before I can get more than a one syllable word out, and I think it was a two syllable word after that. And it was, it was very tough sledding for a while. Um, he, and this is something I got from his mom and him, that he has uh, no friends to speak of, um, and he engages in nothing in the community, no activities. The extent of his social and leisurely life is playing video games, playing Wii. Um, and his social anxiety was great enough so that he would communicate his goal through high school is to be invisible. I would ask, you know, so, so tell me about talking to people. He says, I don't, I don't like to. Okay, why don't you like to? Uh, I don't like it. So do you ever want to talk to people? And he told me, I don't want to talk to people, I just want to keep my head down until I leave. That's, and I mean, it, it hurts so much because we all understand how important communication is for self-actualization. And this is where you start doing the necessary steps towards self-actualization is that transition period between you know 14 and 18 where you start understanding, I'm going to have to provide for my own needs. Um, he had very little self-awareness. He did not understand why it was a problem that his eyes were down and he actually didn't know what he was doing. I said, why aren't you looking at me? He said, I am, and he's looking down. Um, and his flexibility, he, his, 
he, we had one meeting that I had a, I had a conference call, and I was, our meeting started at 3, and started at 3.02. And I could see that his face was red, not from anger, but from stress, that things are different. I thought we had this meeting at 3, and it is 3.02, and he's looking at the clock. I remember I, I walk into our like reception area, and he's staring at the clock. And so that's, that speaks to his flexibility. Um, so we decided that we wanted, we took him to his observation and we saw a couple interesting things. Okay, because the idea is we don't want to, we're not starting these kids from scratch. It's not that there's nothing that we can build on. Each kid has strengths, we gotta find them. And we gotta find them in that four hour observation. Um, so something we found, he loves building. And we knew that from the get go. He told us, first thing he said about his interest interview was that he loves building. Um, he loves Legos, he loves Bionicles, he loves anything that has to do with building or having to construct something, especially when there's instructions involved. Um, because there's a discrete way to do things and it's square peg, square hole. Um, and safety of children. Now, something that was really interesting about him is in his observation, despite being very anxious about engaging students, we were on the wind tunnel exhibit, so it's like this, about this thing big, it's a tunnel, and these kids put in these parachutes and they go up and the kids freak out and think it's really cool. And we're helping kids make these parachutes. And across the building, there's a couple kids climbing on one of the, they have like this little cabin house that's this big with little tiny chairs. And, and a couple kids start climbing on it. And he gets up and he looks at me and then goes over. And he didn't know what to say, but he knew he had to say something. So his interest in the safety of others is there. And that's awesome because that is a great job skill. That can get him a job. Those inherent instincts are, can, can make him very uh, interesting in the workforce. So let's build on that. Um, so what we did is we gave him a title. We said, all right, so what your, your job when you're on shift is you're in charge of safety. You're in charge of the kid's safety. That gave him a sense of self-respect because he now has a title and he has a responsibility. Um, and something else we found interesting about him is he is very much driven by accomplishing tasks. And when he has a task given to him, he's going to get it done. And that's something we love about him. He's awesome. Um, and in doing so, he now initiates conversations with parents and kids. And now, they're just as of last week, he's now initiating conversations that have nothing to do with safety. He's now asking about interests. He's asking about how old these kids are. He wasn't starting a conversation. He didn't start a conversation with me. Like, it took hours until he could tell me, you know, what he liked to do. Um, so it was so cool. Um, and he doubled his work tolerance. Before he could make it about an hour and a half, before he, he would say, I need to take a break. And if he's communicating he needs to take a break, he needed to take a break an hour ago. Um, and now he can go about four hours, and he, had, and he doesn't ask for a break, and he also doesn't show any signs of agitation or anxiety, um, which is awesome, because it's, it's not just about the program itself, but he has something that weekly, he has four hours that are designated to being social, and he didn't have that for years. Um, so it really speaks to the need for social interaction to self-actualize. Um, another case. Uh, we're probably, yeah, we're just about out of time. Um, so all these things, so, so these are students now that are high functioning and they, they are in our community. Um, some of them rip your tickets to the movie theater. Some of them make your sandwiches. Um, some of them can come off as disinterested or irritable. And you might see them as being a jerk, and a lot of these kids do, and that's a, a lot of times the review of one of these kids from their peers is, oh, well, he's a jerk. Um, so, and it's, it's no one's job to diagnose any problems with anybody else except a doctor. So that's not our job. However, um, we have to be copies of the fact that there are people that are fighting tough battles, especially socially, because it's nothing for one of us to come out in the community, because we did that today, but for some people, it's, it seems like a matter of life and death.